welcome to 3IE's Evidence Dialogues interview series, where we hear the thoughts of prominent leaders and influencers in the field of international development and pose key questions to them about the role of evidence-informed decision-making and their own evidence journeys. Today, in our first episode, we will be speaking with Dr. Seth Berkeley, who is the CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Seth, how have research and evaluation producing reliable evidence been useful for helping Gavi decide how best to do its work for achieving its mission uh, as a catalytic world leader on vaccine delivery and immunization? Are there some concrete examples that stand out for you? So um, thanks, David, for the question. Um, obviously, um, we are a learning organization and data is critical to being able to understand how we operate and how to operate better in the future. So there are evaluations and then there is routine monitoring and um, work on collecting data to optimize the work we do and ensure we're moving forward. So let me give you an example of something positive and something negative. So. Um, we recently had the world's first malaria vaccine um, get approved. Of course, the challenge was that even though it showed efficacy, it was relatively modest and it required four doses, three of which were outside of the normal schedule. So to understand whether this would be implementable, we set up and funded with other agencies a multi-year um, uh, uh, a program to look at the implementation of the malaria vaccine in three African countries in real life. And the issue there was to measure, could it be delivered? Would people continue to use bed nets? And finally, would we see the mortality reductions that were actually predicted in the original clinical trials? The original clinical trials were so good that there weren't a lot of deaths either in the intervention area or the others. And the estimates were, um, given how prevalent malaria is, for every 200 um, children you vaccinated, you would see um, uh, one death prevented. And um, this uh, program has shown that it's implementable, uh, that they've been able to keep other interventions. And now we're still finishing the part of looking at deaths, but there seems to be a reduction. So that would be an example of using data for implementation. An example of something that was put together by our donors, by our board, was a performance-based um, uh, um, uh, system that was set up to help countries. And, and the question was, in, in doing that, was that having an effect? Did we align those incentives? So were the people who were doing the work seeing those incentives? And it turned out that that was not the case. And when we actually looked at this, given the time length it took from the time you had performance to when it was finally recognized, given the measurement systems and the complexities, given the fact that the savings or the money went to the country and not to the people doing the program, it wasn't having a dramatic effect. So these are two examples of where we are enhancing work on something, reducing work on other uh, based upon concrete data. Let's go on to the next question now. Um, the COVAX facility was launched almost exactly two years ago with leadership from Gavi. Can you give us a short update on the current status of the initiative? Also, looking back uh, on your experience with it, what's been, what have been the biggest lessons uh, that emerge from COVAX? Well, of course, we could do an hour just on this topic, but let me see if I can do it justice with a few things. In terms of, of, of what we wanted to do, we knew the experience in 2009 with pandemic flu was such that wealthy countries bought up all of the doses and there were none available for developing countries. So that is what we were trying to avoid. Um, is that we knew there would be some nationalism, but the issue was, could we do something about it? And, um, you know, we've had a very hard time. There was terrible vaccine nationalism. There were export bans. But I mean, the good news is we had within 39 days of the first vaccination in a high income country, we had a vaccination in a developing country. Um, it, uh, 30 days later, we saw the first uh, doses on the African continent. And 60 days after that, we saw a vaccine get to 100 countries. 
Um, today, um, we've distributed now about 1.45 billion doses in 145 countries. And more importantly, if we look at coverage, low and lower middle income countries now are about 45 percent uh, two dose coverage. And that compares to 59 percent globally. So not quite um, together, but but obviously coming up and equity is better than it's been. Of course, that averages hide the, dis the disparities between the very low income countries, the fr fragile countries where coverage is still low. Even there, we're making progress. 34 countries in January with less than 10 percent. Today, 18 countries, of which 15 are fragile. So, um, you know, the initiative is moving. What are some of the lessons learned? Well, first of all, um, we did not have any money at the beginning. So having contingent financing available would have meant that we could have, out of the blocks, started negotiating deals, working on technology transfers. We also didn't have surge capacity. Gavi is a very low um, overhead organization, 2.47%. Um, the donors love that. But of course, that meant that when the surge had to happen, you know, until we could make the case with the board and get finance and more FTEs, people had to work doubly hard. And, and I would say, um, you know, lastly, is we have to understand that at the end, every leader will pay attention to their own population. After all, that's what they should do. So we expected nationalism. It was even more severe than we expected. And I think for that, one of the issues is how to help keep vaccines flowing, one, one solution is to have a more distributed network of vaccine manufacturing. So um, uh, Gavi, when it started in 2000, there were five manufacturers, four of the five were in developed countries. Um, by um, um, right before COVID, we were up to 18 manufacturers, the majority in developing country, and um, yet only one on the African continent. And so one of the challenges is, can we expand more, not you know, having vaccine manufacturing in every country, but can we distribute those, particularly in smaller countries that um, would be in a position to saturate their populations quickly in emergency and be able to supply other countries? So I think those are some um, big lessons. I'll add one more, which is um, we, um, because we didn't have doses, um, you know, last year, countries weren't doing the intense planning because there were like no doses to plan against. And we probably should have put more effort in delivery, even when there weren't as many doses flowing, because when the doses have flown and now we have enough doses for everybody, um, you know, that has really become the bottleneck in getting the types of coverage that we should have in a pandemic. Well, congratulations for achieving so much in, in the, under so much time pressure. Uh, that is in the nature, isn't it, of uh, unexpected uh, uh, pandemics. Uh, you, you don't have that advanced time to, uh, to plan, but you certainly achieved a lot. And uh, 2.47 as, as an overhead rate has got to be a world record. I don't know how you all can stay alive uh, working overtime as much as you must have to do. Well, the secret is we're an alliance. And as an alliance, yeah. what that means is we don't have to duplicate any of those services. Of course, that yeah. creates its own complexity, but it does create certain efficiencies. Terrific. Great. Let's go on to another question. Uh, what important breakthroughs are you looking for to help Gavi achieve its objectives? Would the breakthroughs relate to new vaccine development or better ways for maximizing vaccine uptake? or in some other area important for Gavi. How would more evaluation and evidence be useful in achieving these breakthroughs? Well, well first of all, all of the things you talked about are important. Um, we now have two vaccines against cancer, uh, malaria vaccine we talked about, um, new vaccines will be coming and we obviously wanna see that. We'd love one for HIV, as you well know, uh, for TB, for other important diseases. Um, we also are looking at you know new, new ways of delivering vaccines, ones that don't need refrigeration or patch technologies and other. But let me go to what I think is the most important in a sense, breakthrough, but it's not really, it's a measurement breakthrough. And that is, um, uh, vaccines are the most widely distributed of all health interventions. Um, and, um, you know, if you look at the routine system, about 90% of, of children and families have access to that system. Of course, that means about 10% do not. Um, and, and, and what's important about that insight is that if you look at that 10%, 
um, you have two thirds of those families are living below the poverty line. And we're seeing about 50% of the under five uh, child mortality sitting in those um, clusters of, of, of families and groups. There's usually a reason why these groups are left out. So what we've begun for our next period is something we'll, we're calling the zero dose agenda, zero dose children. And these are those children and they're easy to measure because they haven't been reached by a single dose of vaccine. So, you know, uh, it's easy to track, it's easy to measure. And if we can start trying to get those children and families into a health system and get services to them and not just vaccination, but vaccination can be the, you know, the, the forefront of these new services, it is a great way to be able to target poverty, target, you know, the last mile, leave no one behind. And that's really what we're trying to do. The tragedy, of course, is that um, during the pandemic, we saw a reduction in immunization overall. But the interesting thing is it wasn't that people got some doses and then didn't complete. Of course, there were some of those, but we saw about a 30% increase in these zero dose families because there were enough at the periphery that they were basically kicked out of the system completely. So we're starting off in a, in a worse place than we were, but we think this is a really good organizing principle, both for equitable coverage, but also uh, poverty reduction. And of course, if we can get others to join us in this, um, it's a really good way to target um, this for the most needed communities. Uh, terrific. And uh, what, a, what a great example for other organizations not just on vaccines, but on other important global problems within health and beyond. I really hope that uh, the story of Gavi and all that you've done uh, gets out there widely and as well documented and studied uh, that other people can learn from. We've got just a few minutes left, uh, Seth. Anything else you'd like the world to know about uh, that, that can help Gavi and its work? Well, I think the most important thing on on, um, you know, immunization, of course, and infectious diseases were not seen as such a high priority. Of course, I believe they are. And, you know, now we have a, a pandemic that has changed the world. But the challenge in 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 these types of events has been, you know, panic and then neglect, panic and neglect. And that's what we saw after the Ebola outbreak in 2015, where people, you know, were, were equally motivated or even after the 2009 flu. I hope after this time that we will understand the importance of this, how disruptive it can be, because it's evolutionarily certain we will have more outbreaks. And it's not what you do in, in so-called wartime that matters. What really matters is in peacetime between epidemics. And, and, and the real critical thing there is building strong, resilient health systems that can provide service, deliver routine vaccines, deal with infectious diseases and other diseases diseases in the interim, but also then have the systems prepared and ready to go to deliver countermeasures for um, epidemics or pandemics and to um, you know, reduce mortality, et cetera. So I think it's really about having that philosophy. And as you know, in, in um, the World Bank came out with the WDR in 1993, making the point that health is an investment. They want to invest in health um, as opposed to being a cost. And this is a good example, and hopefully people will remember this uh, post the pandemic. What a great set of messages, which uh, all of us uh, should do our best to share around the world, uh, and a great way to tie it all up and to end this short uh, interview. And uh, I think we owe you a, a lot of thanks. You, uh, Seth, you, Gavi, and uh, uh, let's hope the world can do its part to support you in the, in the, uh, in the continuing challenges ahead.